Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, and we shall pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. And we're talking about the priority of Christ in the new man's life. Uh, this is part 1B. Uh, there will be no 1C. Uh, we're going to get through this today, this morning. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. We'll just be dealing with verse 12 this morning. It reads, therefore, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You may be seated. Father, we thank you so much for another Sunday, another Lord's Day where we come together to worship you in song, in hymns, spiritual songs, to worship you by giving back to you a portion of what you have given to us signifying that all that we have and all that we are belongs to you. That we have made the transition from the first Adam to being none of the second Adam who is Christ. Demonstrating that our souls are truly anchored in the Lord and that our lives are anchored by him. Thank you for another Thanksgiving season. We could not adequately give all the thanks to you that you so richly deserve, but we pray that we made an attempt to acknowledge that everything we are and everything that we're no longer, that we used to be, is all due to you. That everything we have and everything we don't have is due to you. And that our greater days are ahead of us than the days that are behind us as we continue to strive towards the perfection, towards the image of Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are traveling that are not here today. We pray for others who are not here. We pray that they're listening somewhere to your word somewhere. But we ask now, Father, that you speak to us that are here this morning that you have prepared a word for our mind, hearts, body, and soul, and that the Spirit will illuminate this holy text into our lives, and that we will not leave here as we came in, but we will leave here more like Christ than we came this morning. Challenge us, convince us, convict us, change us, conform us. Show us yourselves the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we will promise to continue to give you praise throughout the day and throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray, let your heart say, amen. As I said, we've entitled this message prior to Christ in the new man's life. And we shared with you last time there were six virtues that we find in this text in chapter 3, verse 12 through 17, that as a result of the new birth, as a result of Christ's preeminence in our life, having his presence in us and with us, because he's preeminent among us and all around us, there are certain virtues that we are to be demonstrating that are contrary to the old vices tied to the old life or the old order of things. It is true that you are not what you used to be. 
And yet we are not all that we are becoming as we move towards glory. But whatever we were in the first Adam, we are no longer to be in the second Adam. And that's not a suggestion. That's not something that's supposed to happen. That's something that is the reality. And if it is not your reality, then you not, cannot truly claim that you have been chosen by God. You see, I believe that one of the problems in our culture, as I've thought about this thoroughly throughout the week and meditated on the scripture, is that the problem in our culture and the problem in our time is that we don't understand the difference between biblical Christianity and cultural Christianity. You see, many people look at the church, and they look at people who attend the church, and they're frustrated by what they see and what they don't see. They see us arguing and backbiting, and they see us slandering, and they see the hatred and the anger and the division. And they say, that Christianity stuff must not be real. But what they don't understand, and I'm afraid that most people in the church don't even understand this, is that cultural Christianity is not biblical Christianity. And what most people are frustrated with and angry with and bitter against is cultural Christianity, not biblical Christianity. You see, in chapter 2 of this text, as we've already discovered, there are people in the church, leaders, teachers, and members, who are teaching things that are false and getting people to believe and base their testimony in their Christian life on things that cannot really save them. And listen to me, dear brothers and sisters, when you have a church full of people who are not really saved, don't be surprised that you see the vices more than you see the virtues. I wish somebody was praying with me this morning. Because all you can produce if you're in Adam, the first Adam, are those vices in verses 5 through 8. Let's review very quickly because it's been a little while and you may have forgotten what the vices are. Look at chapter 3 of verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them. These are all past tense verbs, action words in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in that state, when you lived in that realm, when you lived in that identity with the old Adam. This was you. But now that you are in the second Adam, this is not you. Because... Your past is your past, and your past is not supposed to be your present. But you see, when you have cultural Christians, and you don't have biblical Christians, cultural Christians look like the past because that's what they're really still alive to. But if you're a biblical Christian, if you have truly been chosen, if you are holy and blameless in Christ Jesus, if you have been moved from the first Adam to the second Adam, second Adam, this is no longer your reality. But if you're listening to the false teachers of chapter 2 who want to captivate you and deceive you and defraud you and rob you of your reward, then don't be surprised that you are not able to overcome the vices of the old because you've never come to the new. 
Dear brothers and sisters and dear friends listening by live stream, biblical Christianity is not cultural Christianity. And there are far too many people in our culture, in our world, for far too long who have been deceived and misguided and misled by watching cultural Christianity. And they've never seen biblical Christianity. You see, it's very easy to determine cultural Christianity from biblical Christianity. Anything that doesn't look like biblical Christianity is cultural Christianity. That wasn't hard, was it? And we keep talking ourselves out of who we are in Christ. Or we sing the songs, my soul is anchored in the Lord. But is Christ anchored in you? Because that's the whole meaning of the text. It's one thing to be anchored in Christ. It's another thing for Christ to be anchored in you. And all of us, every day, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, are being tested to see if we're authentic. But we keep talking chapter 2 language and not chapter 3 language. My great fear is that many of you or some of you are people who listen to us preach Sunday after Sunday will bust hell wide open through church. Because they were only cultural Christians, they weren't biblical Christians. See, you and I are only biblical Christians when we look like what the Bible says a Christian is supposed to look like. When you're producing what the Bible says Christianity produces. Now, granted, none of us do it perfectly. But are you even guilty of having any semblance of consistent Habitual patterns of the virtues found in chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. See, there's an adage in the Bible, there's a saying in the Bible that says, you can only reap what you sow. In other words, whatever is sown, you can only reap from what you have sown. In other words, whatever the seed is, that's what should come about the ground. And if Christ has been sown and the word of God has been sown in your soul and created you a new creation and old things are passed away, where's the fruit of the seed? If the seed was, as Peter says in 1 Peter an incorruptible seed, then how come you still got so much corruption? How come I still got so much corruption coming out of my life? If the seed is incorruptible, shouldn't the fruit be incorruptible? But if the seed is corruptible, don't be shocked you getting corrupt fruit in your life. This ain't brain surgery, this is Bible surgery. But if you keep listening to the people in chapter 2, they'll keep rationalizing away the fact of the evidence that is coming up in your life. And I don't mean we don't all have moments. But to have the vices as they are dominating our churches in modern day America coming up over and over again. Somebody's got to have the guts to say, something wrong with that. Somebody's got to have enough courage to say, that don't look like biblical Christianity. And you can be fooled by cultural Christianity. Because cultural Christianity has a way of generating its own fruit by its own effort. But you can't generate biblical fruit by your own effort. You must be born again. You must be a new creation. You must have had incorruptible seed planted in your soul. And this now bears 
incorruptible fruit. Turn with me to 1 Peter because I want you to see it for yourself. Because as we said last time, we spent last, we're chosen. And God, through Christ, chose you. You didn't choose yourself. See, cultural Christianity tells you you can save yourself. Biblical Christianity says God must do the saving. Cultural Christianity says you work it up. Biblical Christianity says, no, you work out what's been worked in. But it all is about what's been planted in you before you can get the right stuff out of you. 1 Peter chapter 1, if you will. I want to lay a good groundwork in this introduction before we talk about fruit. He says in verse 18, let's start with verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. See, listen, get your mind right. You got to get your mind right. Stop being conformed to this world system and be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. But you can't get to Romans 12, 2 if you don't have Romans 12, 1. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But once that is done, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, let, let, me, let, let, me not, let me read it the way it doesn't say it. As somewhat obedient children, as every other day obedient children, as Sunday morning only obedient children. No, it says as obedient children. Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts. You are not what you used to be. Therefore, you can't keep acting like what you used to be if that's not what you be any longer. And you're not it any longer, not because of anything that you and I have done, because you have been chosen. Because you are holy and you are blameless. As in your ignorance. You're not ignorant any longer. What's all this running around? I, I, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't, know, I don't know how to get it together. I don't know how to get it right. That's ignorance talking. You are no longer ignorant. Why? Because as we saw in Colossians chapter 1 and 2, the wisdom of God that is in Christ Jesus has been birthed in your soul. You're letting the word of God richly dwell in you. You have the wisdom that comes from above, not the wisdom that is of this earth. Don't you know who you are? But as he called you, as he elected you, as he chose you, as he saved you, but as he called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, behavior. See, we, we, we like to feel guilty about sin. We don't like to repent. And guilt and repentance are not the same thing. You can feel guilty about what you're doing that's not lying with and never change a thing. But if you repent. If you turn from this and turn towards that, there has to be some action following the guilt. There has to be some fruit following the guilt. Because I'm holy. I'm not unholy anymore. I'm not ungodly. I'm godly. I'm not unrighteous anymore. I'm righteous. And that now has to be what? The fruit of my life, because that's the seed that's been planted within. But you've been listening to them people in chapter 2. Who've been giving you rationales for why you can still act the way you act and behave the way you behave and think the way you think. 
and still be saved. You'd rather cut off a body part than repent. Like the ascetics. You'd rather discipline your flesh and beat your flesh, but you don't want to repent. Then you got the nerve to get mad and not come to church anymore. Don't want to do Bible study. Don't want to go to prayer meeting. Don't want to pray. Don't want to do anything because I'm struggling. No, that ain't struggling. That's doing. Struggling has the idea of struggling against. And we call struggling, I call it doing. If you're doing it, you ain't struggling against it. You doing it. And the only solution is you got to repent. But you got to understand whom you are and who you are. And stop listening to the lying preachers and teachers telling you something different. And stop listening to your own persuasive argument. Some of y'all need to get outside of your head. Because you're sitting there telling your stuff, and it's, it's not anything that the Bible has to say. It's not lining up with Scripture, but you believe in your own persuasive argument. You need to get free. Because it's written, verse 16, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to the one who works, conduct themselves, conduct yourself, I'm sorry, throughout the time of your stay here on, in fear. Here's the other problem. We no longer fear God. We no longer fear the judgment of God. We no longer fear the presence of God. If we were in the Old Testament, we would have walked right up to the mountain with the dark clouds and the voice booming out and strutted our stuff right up there with all our sin on because we have no fear of God. Verse 18 is where I want to get. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct. You was living going nowhere, just drifting along, aimlessly. But you were delivered from that. But with the precious blood of Christ as the land without blemish and without spot, you weren't purchased with cheap stuff. You weren't purchased with corruptible stuff. You were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary. You are somebody. Not because of you, but because of him. And if God thought enough to send his son to purchase you, where's the appreciation he so richly deserves in response? He indeed was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Is your faith and hope in God? Do you know, do you know your faith and hope in God has to be that? Because if he didn't do it, then it's all a fantasy and a fable. If your hope and your faith is not what God has done through Jesus Christ, there is no hope for you. There is no hope for me. So this leads us back to Colossians. And this is where I want to start with point B. The fruit is a result of Christ's character. If you're created in the image of him, if you're being molded and shaped into the image of him, then your character has to be the character of Christ. And you have the ability, I have the ability to produce the character of Christ because of the seed that has been planted in us. The new life. The new creation. And now I have the ability to put to death the members of my flesh are on the earth. I have the ability to put off the old vices. I have the ability to put on the new virtues. But you yourselves must do this. 
but it's possible because of what God has done in Christ. Now, if God did it and has done it and is done done, what's the problem? Somebody not putting off, somebody not putting to death, and somebody not putting on. What would it be like for, for me to go out and buy you a thousand dollar? Let's just, let's get greedy. I buy you a new war robe of ten thousand dollars worth of clothes, but then you run around complaining how bad your old clothes look and smell. What you doing with those clothes on when I just bought you ten thousand dollars worth of new clothes? And so, what is it for us to say? I keep coming up with dirty clothes, dirty living, dirty attitude, dirty behavior, and dirty conduct when God says, I bought you a million dollars worth of clothes in Jesus Christ. And you won't even put them on. Well, I just like looking at them. That ain't what he bought them for. I just like bringing people over so they can see my million dollar war robe. That ain't what he bought them for. Listen, you have the new clothes for the same reason Madison Avenues have models in the store windows. So somebody can see the clothes on, so they find the clothes so attractive on that model, they want to put them on themselves. See, the problem in the church, cultural Christianity keeps producing the old clothes, they don't produce the new clothes. So when people look in the window and they see us, and they look at you on your job, and they see you. And they look at you at your home, and they see you. And they keep seeing you dressing them old clothes. They don't believe there's such a thing as new clothes. When they keep seeing us racially divided, and ethnically divided, and socially divided, and politically divided, and they see us hating one another, and slandering one another, and being bitter, and envious, and jealous, They say, we can go buy those clothes off the rack for ourselves. But when they see these new clothes, and they're not finding them in your common everyday store, somebody will be asking you, where are you getting your wardrobe from? Where you buy them clothes at? And now you got an opportunity to share the gospel because they can't get these clothes unless they are chosen, unless they are born again unless they transfer from the old Adam to the new Adam. Now, the clothes are not just for me, meant for you to wear so you can talk about how good you look. The clothes are meant to what? Be contrast to the old clothes. And draw people who are being dressed in the old clothes to those who are wearing new clothes. Paul now begins to describe the behavior and attitudes God expects in response to what he has done in choosing them, making them holy and blameless. And the five virtues of the new life are direct contrast to the vices of the old life. They don't go together. Don't be mixing and matching the clothes either. You anger on Monday and you tender on Tuesday. Don't come mess with me on angry Monday. Come see me on tender Tuesday. And please don't mess with me before I have my cup of coffee. You mean coffee can make you right, right, but the Holy Spirit can't? There is to be an outward manifestation of an inward transformation because there, there's been an incorruptible seed planted. But it's no good to have the seed planted inwardly if we don't see a difference in behavior outwardly. New creation identity must illustrate itself in new creation behaviors. While putting off the old life, believers must put on the new life. And to put on means to clothe yourself, be clothed then. Now, there are some other clothing that we as believers have that are different than these clothing. And they have a different purpose. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, it says that we are to put on the armor of Christ. That's for warfare. This is for daily living. That's for warfare. This is for daily living. See, you need the armor of God for warfare. That the text in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 5, is about spiritual warfare. That's to deal with Satan and the dominions of the demons. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wickedness. That's for warfare against Satan and the demonic forces. This is for daily living. And some people are dressed in armor for spiritual warfare, but are not able to battle when it comes to daily living because you got the wrong clothes on. You got warfare clothes on. That's why you're fighting everybody. No, you need to put on these clothes for daily living, for interacting with people. He's going to get to this in chapter 4. When I get there, he's going to talk about wives and husbands, husband and wife, parents and children, children and parents. He's going to talk about slaves and masters. He's going to talk about you in the public world. That's in relationships with people. This is what you need these clothing for. And we get stuff mixed up. He told you in Ephesians, this is not a flesh and blood accessory. Y'all know what this is. You know you don't wear clothes that you wear when you go to certain places, when you go to other places. Can I get a witness? Ladies, men, we just throw on whatever. But there are certain clothes you wear that what, are appropriate for the occasion. You need the armor of God for spiritual warfare. You need these clothes to deal with people in your daily social relationships. Pastor, I put on my armor this morning. But the devil ain't messing with you right now. People are. You got the wrong clothes on for the wrong occasion. That's why you losing. Get it straight, y'all. He says there are five virtues, and here they are. The chosen are to put on tender mercies. We talked about this a little bit last time, but I want to reiterate it. Put on tender mercies. And I took you to Joseph in Genesis 5, chapter 50, verse 15 to 21, to show you what that looked like. We know the story of Joseph, or you should know the story of Joseph. His brothers did him wrong. His father set him up for his siblings to hate him because he treated him like he was special. And Joseph was put in the pit, then he was sold into slavery, and then he was misused in Pharaoh's household. He got lied on by Pharaoh's wife, talking about she wanted, he wanted to have sex with her when she was the one chasing him. Was thrown in prison and left there and forgotten about. If anybody has some family history that he should have had a problem with, it should have been Joseph. If anybody should have been mad at God, it should have been Joseph because if God, if you love me, why you let me go through all this? But in chapter 50, Joseph's brothers come to see him. And you you remember from last time, their father dies. But the brothers are now scared because Joseph's in a powerful position now. Joseph has the power of life and death in his hand now. He is second in command in Pharaoh's household. And the brothers are in need because of the famine going on, and they have to go down and see old Joseph, and they're scared. Because we don't have daddy to protect us, because even if he didn't like us, he would respect dad. But dad did. And when they come before Joseph, he shows them tender mercy. And he realized that in the sovereignty of God, get this, brothers, in the sovereignty of God, whatever has happened to him has happened because of the sovereignty of God. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. So the reason I can show you tender mercies, because I know it wasn't you, it was God the whole time. 
Are you tender? Some of y'all show mercy, but you do it like you got a lemon in your throat. Face all twisted. You do it with an attitude. That ain't tender. It's a heart of compassion. It means feeling tender mercies deep down in your gut. We don't even care about unsaved folk, let alone one another. It's, it's the idea of what, Pat, what Jesus did when he showed passion and compassion towards the Jews when he saw them with people who were sheep without a shepherd. He felt it deep down in his bowels. We're so busy, we don't feel nothing anymore. We see people hurting. We see people without Christ. We see people going down for the last count, and we have no tender mercy. We have more tender mercy for the commercial about the dogs and the pound than we do people who are lost in sin. They put them little sad looking puppies on there and because they're trying to get to your bowels. They're trying to get deep down so they can get to your wallet. I turn the channel every time. I don't want no sad looking dog looking at me like that, like I done them wrong. Pastor, you mean you have no tender mercies for the dog? None. But I do have tender mercies for people. See, it's a sad society that has more tender mercy for dogs than they do people. We want to save the polar bears and the other bears, and we just let abort babies in the womb by the million. We, wanna, we got the tree huggers, want to hug the trees in the rainforest. Ain't never been to a rainforest. But won't even hug your neighbor next to you on the job. Where's the tender mercy? The believer has to put on heartfelt compassion, be clothed with it, have a deep gut level feeling of compassion. This virtue was so needed in the ancient world for the sick, the injured, the orphans, the elderly who often left were left to fend for themselves. This revolutionized the pagan world when they saw believers doing this. Some of you were here a couple of Wednesdays ago and you heard Tim Keller talk about five um, characteristics that, that, that were characteristics of the early church that impacted the culture. And one of them was their concern for the poor, the orphans, the widows, children who were born in Roman families but rejected by their family, thrown out on the doorstep, thrown out in the street, thrown in the dumpster. The church would go and get those kids and raise them. The widows who were rejected because they were too old, they were a burden to the younger families. The church went and got them because they were a people of tender mercies. Now we lock away our old folk and our, our senior adults in a home and don't even go visit them. But that's what cultural Christianity does. It's not what biblical Christianity does. Secondly, the chosen are to put on kindness. Are you kind? Am I kind? Are, are you kind? I didn't ask you if you were nice. I asked you, are you kind? He says in this verse, not only tender mercies, but put on what? Kindness. This is a reference to goodness towards others that pervades the entire person, mellowing out all the harsh aspects of them. See, when you're angry, when you're bitter, when you're hatred, when you have hatred in your heart, when you're a slander, when you're an adulterer, you aren't kind. And it's not enough to be kind to people who are kind towards you. Can you be kind to the people who are not kind towards you? That's the test of kindness. Kindness. That is generated by the Holy Spirit. That is generated by the power of God. 
in spite of what they've done to you in the past. Listen, the Greek term refers to grace that pervades the whole person. It, 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 it controls you. It fills you. Mellowing out all that might be harsh. It's the idea of not being harsh. Not a lot of kind people in churches today. And it's especially kind towards their, those who are hard to bear. Lord have mercy. See, it's easy for you to be kind towards people who are easy to be kind to. But the test of the new Adam in you is can you be kind towards those that are hard to bear and difficult to put up with? Are you kind? But pastor, what about all the wrong that was done in history? It pales in comparison to all the wrong you've done to Jesus Christ. Yeah, but what about this and that and that and this? What about just being kind? When you get done rolling out your list and get done talking about all your history and you get done talking about all the wrong that's been done, are you kind? See, you don't have to cancel culture if you're kind. You don't have to be woke if you're kind. You don't need CRT if you're kind and tender hearted. Listen, God is even kind to those who are ungrateful and evil in the Bible. Oh, yeah, I got one amen. See, y'all don't want to be like God. God is kind to sinners. He doesn't skip their sin. But the Bible says the grace and mercy of God falls on the just and the unjust. It's not just save obedient farmers who get rain when they need rain. Let me hook you up with a deep one. It's just not saints who get oxygen every day. God is kind towards the just and the unjust. But he will deal with their sin eventually. He will judge them. But in the meantime, in the meantime, he's showing them all kinds of kindness. And they still won't come to him. Jesus was the kindest person ever. And they killed him. Kindness does not keep people from opposing you. It just makes you more like Christ. See, we live in a culture where what's the benefit if I do this? See, the problem is the reason why we want to do all the protesting and marching and rebellion and revolting and standing for our right, if we, can't, we don't believe that if we demonstrate these kind of characteristics, we will accomplish the same goal. See, that's the problem. We don't believe if we demonstrate this fruit and we demonstrate this kind of forgiveness and demonstrate this kind of love and demonstrate this kind of obedience to the word and in whatever we do, if we do this, that God will win people and break down barriers and soften hearts. We got to revolt. We got to fight. We got to argue. We got to backbite. We got to slender so I can feel good. We got to bring up all the history of the wrongs done. I sure hope God don't do that when you get to heaven. I'm talking about cultural Christians. That's what they do. Biblical Christians don't do that. Biblical Christians do this. And this is not acceptable among Christians in our culture. Luke 6.35 says this, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. This was radical in the first century. 
We can love people to love us, but love who? Love your enemies? Well, if you're created in the, in the image of Christ and you're being conformed to the image of Christ, that's Romans chapter 5 that said that God loved his enemies? And if we are children of God, if we are the chosen of God, or if we are the offsprings of God, shouldn't we be like our daddy? Well, I can't love them people who did all that stuff in 1619 and 1776 and 1800s. Then you're a cultural Christian, you're not a biblical Christian. Pastor, how do you say that? Because that's what the Bible says. Well, you don't understand. Yes, I do understand. I understand you are not what you used to be. And that you got to put off and put on. And the greatest test for what you're putting off and putting on is the very people you think don't deserve it. Because you didn't deserve God's grace, but he gave it to you anyway. You didn't deserve to be chosen by God, but he chose you anyway. You didn't deserve to be saved, but he saved you anyway. You don't even deserve to go to heaven, but you're going anyway. But what about my rights? You have the right to die. That's it. And you don't even control that because it's appointed to you when you're going to die. And then the judgment. Listen. Turn with me to Luke 10. You guys need illustrations. I give you illustrations. Luke 10. Now, now, it frustrates me. It frustrates me to listen to people preach this text about the Good Samaritan. They don't even understand it. Let me, let me hook you up just very quickly. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, now, now what's the question on the floor? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So this is a salvation text. This ain't a social justice text. Like some people try to make it. The issue on the floor is, what must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus goes into the parable of the Good Samaritan. So what's the point of the text? The people who inherit eternal life respond like this. It ain't about social justice. It's about eternal life. Are y'all with me? Most people who try to teach social justice and are social justice advocates take this text to try to use it for so it's about an eternal life. You have no right to edit God. So he, he, he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, yeah, but, now it's not, it's not a text, but that's what it is. You answer rightly, do this and you will live. Jesus responds to the question, how am I inherit eternal life? Do this and you will live. The only problem is you can't do this. Not in the first Adam state. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem, to Jericho, and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. See, what Jesus is getting at, here is the fruit of eternal life. It's not the work that you do to inherit eternal life. It's the evidence that you have eternal life. How you respond to God and how you treat your neighbor is the evidence or fruit of eternal life. It is not how you get eternal life. Likewise, verse 32, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. 
So the priest, the pastor passed by on the other side, the Levite passed by on the other side, but a certain Samaritan, Lord have mercy. Now, we don't understand this because we don't understand the culture. You, you got a black panther laying in the road. The other black panther members come by and they pass them by. The government comes and they pass them by. But a Ku Klux Klan member comes by and hooks him up. That, that's the text. The priest who should have, because he's supposed to be a man of God, didn't. The Levite, who's supposed to be a man of God and be for the God, didn't. But the very one who shouldn't have helped him, helped him. Because they got some history issues. Oh, y'all ain't praying with me this morning. The Samaritan, the dirty dog, the low-down dirty dog, the one who was unclean helped the one who was clean. Watch this now. Jesus is a master, master storyteller. Likewise, but a certain Samaritan, verse 30, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. There it is. Tender mercies, kindness. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Pouring oil and wine, he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Notice he didn't call 911. Notice he didn't call somebody else to come and do what he could do. On the next day, verse 35, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Put your money where your mouth is. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him, then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. What was the question? Good teacher, how am I in her, in her eternal life? What's the response? Love your neighbor. First love God, then love your neighbor. In other words, keep the five, first five Ten Commandments that are oriented towards God. Keep the second five of the Ten Commandments that are oriented to your neighbor. But don't just keep them religiously. Put some tender mercy and compassion toward those who least deserve it in your eyes. And then you will give evidence that you have eternal life. It's not the means, it's the outworking of eternal life. That you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and that you love your neighbor as yourself is the outworking. But you see, in the first Adam, you can't keep either one. But in the second Adam, it will be the outworking because you, have, you are a new creation. You are not what you used to be. And then you will give evidence that you have eternal life. See, they were cultural churchgoers. They weren't biblical churchgoers. Thirdly, the chosen are to put on humility. We'll run through these very quickly because I think you get the point now. So the believer, the chosen one, the elected one, the holy one, the beloved one is to put on tender mercies, kindness, and humility. This is the perfect antidote to the self-love of any society. And we live in a society that's all about self-love. What's all this taking pictures of yourself and posting? Nobody wants to see you that bad. Why do you take food of what you're eating? I don't care. And not too many other people care either. But it's all about, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. You can't even score a touchdown without, look at me. Act like you've been there before. All you did was carry a little pig skin full of air across a white line. Why do we need to look at you? 
you got to dance, you got to sit down and roll, on the, you got to do all these performances because it's the look at me generation. Because we don't have any humility. What we have is pride. Word to the parents, your kids ain't all that. My kids aren't all that. Stop making them think that the world revolves around them because it does not. And let them keep living long enough to where they got to go out there and face the world and they'll find out. They don't really care about you. Self-love poisons human relationships. It took Christianity to elevate humility as a virtue in the first century. First century. Self-love and pride was the dominant characteristic of people in the first century. But Christianity comes along and it's all about humility. Thinking less of yourself than you ought. Not thinking more of yourself than you ought. But thinking of yourself only as God sees you. Listen, no more than you of yourself, no less than yourself. We don't respect authority in our culture anymore. We slander our parents. We slander our leaders. We slander our teachers. We slander the pastor. Pastors slander the congregation. No humility. Turn to 1 Samuel. Chapter 24. Let's look at the man who's after God's own heart and see what humility looks like. Now, you really need to read 18 to chapter 24 for context. We just don't have time to read all that. But Saul has a problem with David. And it starts in chapter 18. Let me read it to you, but I'm going to jump over to chapter 24. In chapter 18, verse 6, it says this. Now, it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of the city of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000, and to me they have ascribed only 1,000. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward, gave him the side eye, was suspicious of him from that day forward. That's what gave him the eye really means. He was suspicious of him. And from that day forward, Saul was, had a very skewed view of David. No matter what David could do, Saul only saw him through his suspicious eyes because of pride. But if you go to chapter 24, verse 8 through 16, let me show you David. Now, throughout that text, 18 to 24, Saul is planning to get rid of David because he can't stand the competition. And he tries to kill David on multiple occasions. Once David was playing the harp and Saul threw a javelin and was trying to kill him and it went right by his head because he's jealous, he's envious because of pride. But look at chapter 24, verse 8. David also arose after he went out of the cave because Saul had been hunting him down and called out to Saul saying, my Lord, the king. Did you see that? Why are you going to call somebody Lord and king that's trying to kill you? Because he respected his position in spite of his behavior. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. That's humility. This guy trying to kill you. He's jealous of you. He's envious. His pride has run amok. But what's David's behavior? David stooped 
with his face to the earth and bowed down. Verse 9, and David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? People lying on David. And Saul believing it. Jump down to verse 16. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? You see a change in behavior going on? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Then he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown me this day how you have dealt well with me, for when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. You read the rest of the passage before that. David, to show his loyalty to Saul, when Saul was sleeping, crept in the cave and cut off part of his robe, showing that he could have killed him in his sleep. And when David told him that he had done that, Saul knew that David wasn't against him because he could have killed him in his sleep. If you can get close enough to cut off a person, part of a person's robe, you can get close enough to stab him to death too. But David, in spite of how Saul was treating him, respected the position as king. Now, if anybody should have slandered the king, it should have been David, shouldn't it? Anybody should have said, King Trump ain't no good. King Biden ain't no good. King Obama ain't no good. They low down, dirty. Should have been David, shouldn't it? But David demonstrated humility. And respect for the position that the king held. Because David understood something we don't understand. He understood Daniel chapter 2 verse 20 and 21. God, the heart of the king is in the hand of God. And he turns it whichever way. He raises up king and he takes out kings. It's all about the sovereignty of God. Too much pride in our culture. And too much pride in the church. Because it's a cultural Christianity, it's not a biblical Christianity. Because biblical Christianity is tender hardness. Biblical Christianity is kindness. Biblical Christianity is what? Humility. Number four, the chosen are put to put on meekness. Meekness, he says, is the next virtue or fruit. This word sometimes is translated gentleness. Is the willingness to suffer injury or insult rather than inflict revenge for such hurts. I referred to you earlier by the Wednesday night study we did recently, listening to Tim Keller. He said one of the third aspects of the early church is they did not seek revenge. They did not seek revenge. You could burn down a house. You could put them in prison. You could burn them at the stake. They would not seek revenge. Because they were meek. And meekness is not weakness. You can't be weak and be meek. It takes a lot of self-control to be weak, be meek in the face of that kind of behavior. But it's strength that God supplies. Not that you muster up on your own. Listen, we can't live in a world of Adam's. First Adam people and think they're going to treat people right? Now, if they have the vices of verses 5 and 8, oh, y'all ain't praying with me this morning. I don't get it. I don't get it among my brothers and sisters. I don't get it how we don't expect sinners to act like sinners. Have you forgotten your own history? Have you forgotten there are some people you lied to in the past? Have you gotten there some people you did dirty stuff to in the past? Some of y'all still doing dirty stuff now. Have you forgotten men or some women that you lied to and told them what they wanted to hear to get something from them that don't belong to you? Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten you have a history of wrongdoing, of abuse, of injustice, of slander, of hatred, of bitterness, of back. Have you forgotten? But
but yet we live in a culture of Christians, quote, unquote, who want God to forget their past, but they won't forget the past of other people. Who don't want all their stuff brought up that they used to do. But we want to bring up the history of our country of stuff that used to happen. Tear down statues. Take names off buildings. How about this? We stopped calling people who didn't look like Christians, Christians. Men who treated blacks as less than human. But we call them pastors and Christians and followers of God. How about we just say, that don't look like biblical Christianity. Let's stop calling them Christians when they don't have the fruit of Christianity. And then maybe people wouldn't be so confused. The confusing thing is they produce fruit that looks like the vices of the first Adam, but you keep trying to identify them like they're under the second Adam. They're not, if that was their habitual, unrepentant way of life. We just need to stop that mess. Stop calling those who were mistreated and who refuse to forgive those when they repent and they confess, stop calling them Christians too. Because the second virtue that we're going to spend time on next week is about forgiveness. If there's nothing to forgive, you would need the next verse. And it says, those you have legitimate complaints about, forgive them. Because when they were under the first Adam, they did exactly what they were born to do. But now that they're on the second Adam, and there's no longer any of those distinctions now that we're in Christ, don't be bringing up the past into this new order. It's nailed on the cross. What you doing dragging it down? Come on, y'all, y'all. Your sins are nailed to the cross, but you want to take other people's sin off the cross and throw it up in their face. The, the problem, brothers and sisters, is not Christianity. It's falling for the false, fake, counterfeit form that Satan comes up and man comes up with and calling it Christianity. That's the problem. Fifthly, the chosen are to put on long-suffering. It's sometimes called, translated patience. Patience is a missing virtue in our culture where you expect to have everything right away. This is the opposite of the vices of quick anger, resentment, wrath, or revenge, and thus best pictures Jesus. Long-suffering endures injustice and troublesome circumstances with the hope for possible coming relief. See, that's why our prayer is to be like John's prayer in Revelation and 1 John. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Because this stuff ain't changing as long as you got first Adams on earth. This stuff is not changing as long as you got an enemy named Satan on earth. This stuff is not changing as long as you got corrupt men developing corrupt systems and running corrupt systems, you need to be praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because this ain't my home anyway. I'm a sojourner. I'm a pilgrim. I'm an alien. I'm passing through. My citizenship is in heaven. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Don't let me seek revenge. Don't let me seek to get, to get, to get my, my, my rights. Don't let me seek to get my just do what I think I deserve. Jesus, either take me home or come quickly. Listen to William Barclay, and I close with these things. He writes, this is the spirit which never loses patience with its fellow man. Patience with their foolish and unteachability never drives them to cynicism or despair. 
others' insults or ill treatment never drive them to bitterness or wrath or malice or slander. That's what it means to be long-suffering. You don't let what other people are doing or not doing control you. There's only one who is to have preeminence in your life. Only one who is present in your life in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that's Jesus Christ. He controls you. You say, Pastor Clay, this is hard. Right. <laughs> Pastor Clay, this is impossible. Absolutely correct. But if you are a new creation, if you're a part of the chosen and not the frozen, if you are holy, if you are beloved and have the incomprehensible love of Christ being showered on you day in and day out, then it is possible. If you have a power with outside of yourself indwelling you and filling you, it is possible for that power, even though it may not be possible for you as a human being. Let me leave you with these three applications. Realize and study what it means to be chosen by God. You got to know what it means to be chosen. So you stop believing false teachers. You stop believing your own persuasive fleshly arguments because you, all you do is dwell inside your head. Secondly, review the virtues, memorize the virtues, pray in light of the virtues, practice the virtues. Don't leave the virtues in the text. Model them in your life. You are the models. We are the models. We put the clothes on so other people can see. And the wardrobe to you was free. But it cost Christ everything. Thirdly and finally, respond by putting off and putting on daily. Don't get tired of putting off and putting on. Don't get frustrated. Put off the old and put on the new. Daily. Daily. And don't put on the armor of God that is meant for spiritual warfare. We need to be putting on the clothes of Christ that are for practical daily living in social relationships. Get your world grow right. Now put these clothes on, but when it comes to spiritual warfare, don't take them off. Put your armor on top of it. Then you got triple protection. But brothers and sisters, this is biblical Christianity. Everything else is a counterfeit. It is possible because it's what God does in the life of the chosen. It's why you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. It's why when we get to the end of this book, this chapter, you must have the word of God richly indwelling you. And that's why it covers every aspect of life. Until either God calls you home or he comes and gets and takes you home. But you yourselves, we ourselves must put on the fruit. The next week, you must put on forgiveness. Father, we just thank you so much. We're not even ready to start putting on forgiveness until we put on the virtues. I believe that you have an order here on purpose. Because I believe one connects the other, but we will find there is a foundational piece of love and unity. I thank you for those here who are striving. I pray for those who are struggling. I pray for those that are hurting. I pray for the weak. I pray for the wayward. I pray for the wicked. Because First Thessalonians tells you we find all kinds in the church. But none of us have an excuse for not living out the righteousness of Christ. 
because you have provided everything we need. We just don't take the time to learn how to use it. Some of us are just refuse to use it. Some of us have been born again so that we can use it. But as you've already said in your word, you have provided everything we need in Christ Jesus pertaining to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. There are no excuses. Help us, Father, to be the models of these virtues from this day forward. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Let your heart say, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.